Good evening and thank you for being here. My name is Byron Johns. I am the chair of the education committee for the Montgomery County NAACP and my co-host here. Hello, buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is Diego Uriburu and I am the proud executive director of identity and together with Byron, we are the co-founders of the Black and Brown Coalition. Before we start, we want to <clears throat> remind everyone that this event will be recorded and it can also be viewed via Zoom. Uh, to access the interpretation, uh, you have to click at the bottom of the page, you have to click the interpretation icon and from there you choose the language of your preference. So, para los que necesitan interpretación, abajo en la pantalla está el icono de interpretación. Le hacen un clic y ahí eligen el lenguaje que ustedes necesitan o que quieren, español, inglés, si ha hablado otro idioma, yo no, no lo puedo traducir. Pero entonces, por favor, cliquen el, el símbolo de interpretación y elijan español. Eh, we also ask you to please mute, mute your, your, um, your mic uh, unless you're asked to speak. Please, please, please. And we also want to let you know that the, the, the chat feature is going to be on and, and you can write your questions, etc., over there. Uh, and um, please uh, remember that we're going to have breakout rooms later. Um, so tonight's meeting is to have a dialogue with our wonderful members of the Board of Education. And uh, the questions that we have prepared are directly coming from black and brown families. Byron. Okay, the intent of tonight's conversation is meant to be informative and respectful. This dialogue is intended as an exchange of ideas that will benefit the community as a whole. So please, you have uh, specific situations for your child or family uh, that this is not the time for introducing that. Um, to atop, accomplish the goal tonight, we've structured this session to be um, a large group all together where we will talk through some uh, questions and topics that are broadly of interest. And then we will have breakout rooms where you will be able to speak directly with and have conversation with board members. So we hope you find that helpful. Again, as Diego mentioned, uh, please feel free to capture in the chat any questions that you may have. Uh, those that we do not get to answer directly during the meeting, we will provide to the board and as appropriate, they will provide uh, any written follow-up. We will get that to all of the attendees. So first <clears throat> and now, greetings and welcome to board president, Brenda Wolf. And Board Vice President Carla Silvestri and the board members. Glad to have you here this evening and want to give you an opportunity to address the audience to make opening comments. Thank you, Byron. Good evening, everyone. It's really great to be here with you this evening. As Byron said, I'm Brenda Wolf, the president of the Board of Education. Although I wish we could be together in person, I believe that the pandemic has taught us that we can come together even if we're not physically together. This event and this partnership are so powerful. We know what it means when parents are actively engaged. At this time, I'm gonna ask my fellow board members to introduce themselves. Slight problem here that I can't see them. I can't tell that so many people on. I can see my vice president, Carla Silvestri. Carla, would you like to say hi? Hello, everyone. Good to see so many people out today. Muy buenas noches a todos. Me agrada mucho ver a tanta madre y padre de familia aquí en este evento. Estamos aquí para escuchar. We're here to listen and to engage, and I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Daca, are you on? It's so many. I can't see if you're on. So if you're on, unmute and say hi. 
I know Judy's usually on somewhere. Okay, I'm gonna go to Miss Evans. Shebra, are you on? She was having trouble with the link. She sent me a text. Brenda, I see Lynn and I see um, Rebecca, if you wanna. Okay, Rebecca Smadrowski, you wanna say hi? Yes, hi, thank you all for being here tonight and inviting us. Look forward to this conversation. I'm Rebecca Swandrowski, and I represent District 2. Thank you. Lynn, Ms. Harris, are you on? Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, so many of you for coming together inside when it's so gorgeous outside. Um, looking forward to uh, the conversation, and um, I am uh, an at-large member of the Board of Education. This is my 15th month on the board. I'm going to try again for Shebra. Are you on? I know. Nope, she's not. She's not able she, to. She's still having trouble getting on. Yeah, she just texted me. She said, yeah. Okay. Um, Scott is on. Oh, Dr. Jafta, Scott. Want to say hi? Scott? Are you on mute? That's the phrase of the decade. You're on mute. Well, I know he's on, so if he unmute. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, Just I apologize. I'm actually uh, in the car, um, but I, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is a Scott Joftis. I'm um, really pleased to be here. I do apologize. I'm having to pick my daughter up from the airport, but I am hoping to participate as much as, as possible. Thank you. Family first. You know, I believe in that. Hannah, our student member of the board, was unable to be with us tonight. Unfortunately, she says she's overwhelmed with homework. So we understand that has to come first. I'm going to try one more time for Shebra. Judy, anybody? Shepard's still having trouble getting in. Then Judy's probably having trouble because she's always here. But anyway, we are really glad to be with you today. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce you to Ravel Fitzpatrick. Ravel, say hi and wave. He is our ombudsman. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be here. You heard Byron say we are not taking any personal situations tonight, but Ravel is the person that you want to contact if you're having trouble uh, maneuvering the system or any other issues that you want to bring to the, bring to our attention. So we are so pleased to have Mr. Ravel Fitzpatrick. He joined us in October, and he has just made such a wonderful addition to our staff. So you know, this year has been trying for all of us. It's been a long two years. I don't know why I'm thinking it's one year, but it's been a long two year. Readjusting to in-person learning brought with it a unique set of challenges from determining when schools should be virtual to determining which mitigation strategies are absolutely necessary. Not to mention the ongoing conversation about vaccinations and our impressive rates of vaccination in this county. This year, the board has had to make many tough decisions. We've, we've wrestled with the question of quarantine durations, mask, staffing shortages, and just plain old community exhaustion from the pandemic. With tough decisions and determinations, we've been able to provide students with not only in-person learning, but a focus on mitigating learning loss, tutoring, athletics, school plays, concerts and festivals, all of the rights, celebrations and community that are foundational to the learning environment. It is our partnership with organizations like the NAACP and the Black and Brown Coalition. You're telling me I have five minutes, Cindy, I see you, thanks. That make a difference. As we look forward, we are committed to our shared work of building a more equitable school system. We will continue to work together addressing disparities in opportunity, as well as disrupted learning, mental health due to the pandemic and the safety issues that we've been seeing in some of our schools. In this very busy world we live in, 
This level of commitment takes real work. It is only, however, by intentionally committing to the time and effort that effective school family partnerships are formed to support student learning. Uh, Shebra, are you on yet? No, she's still not seeing. I'm, somebody texting me, so I thought it was her. She's trying to log on through the phone. So I appreciate all of you and the dedication you have. Together, we will make a difference for every one of our families. Hearing from our MCPS families and their lived experiences informs the work of the board. These times are unprecedented, but they are not unnavigable. I'm reminded of our first lady, Michelle Obama, who said, history has shown us that courage can be contagious. Today, we have the courage to stand together for what is right, what is just, what is equitable, and what is best for our community. The courage that exists in this room alone can be contagious enough to make sure our schools, our communities, and our families are stronger and better than they have ever been before. I welcome your advocacy and together we can create a school system that offers the opportunities and challenges for all of our students. Again, thank you for having us. Byron, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, President Walt, and appreciate your, your words. And so we're gonna get right into it. I'm gonna ask uh, our uh, Nora Morales to tee up our first uh, questions for the board. Hi, good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, board members, we'd appreciate it if you could limit your uh, answers to one minute. So uh, I'm starting off with our first topic, which is safety and wellness. As you know, the pandemic has had an impact on our students' mental health and reactions to stress and trauma. Nationally and locally, we are seeing increased incidents of fighting, sexual assaults, and bullying in schools, and the need for social emotional support is urgent. What investments and initiatives are you as the board focusing on to address those critical needs in our schools now, especially given that budgeted for mental health support positions are hard to fill? One minute, please. Is that one minute? I'm gonna give my board members an opportunity to speak. This is one, this, I can't see you all, so just jump in there. I think it started. Um, one minute. Okay, so um, what we're trying to do, uh, Nora, thank you for the question, is to build a comprehensive array of services that help our students and staff deal with the mental health challenges that we're all grappling with. Everything from integrating check-ins and wellness into classroom lessons to a well-being teams, a team of staff that intervenes when things go wrong, all the way to therapy in person and uh, virtual. So we're really trying to address it. Uh, I'll let my other colleagues uh, jump in on all the things that I'm missing, but my point here is a wide array of services from low touch to high touch. Thank you, Ms. Silvestre. Who would like to answer the question next? Uh, let me just say, Nora, thank you for the question. We have added restorative justice coaches at our secondary schools, and we've received funding to train 11,000 of our staff members. So I just wanted to add that to what Carla says. We have tier two staff training. Um, for, for restorative practices and mindfulness. And we've expanded the employee assistance program for our staff because like we know the pandemic has impacted our students, it has also impacted our staff. Thank you so much, Ms. Wolf. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll just pipe in quickly. Um, my deep interest is in our work that is very focused on prevention and ensuring that we really are creating schools in which everybody feels safe, welcome, and valued, being exactly who they are, 
that's staff, students, visitors, everybody. Um, and, sh- and so that gets to our, our trauma-informed practices. That gets to how we partner with the county with their um, positive youth development and street outreach net, net street outreach network work. Um, and all of you know the way that we we kind of create an um, an atmosphere in our buildings where we minimize the the chance that that the kinds of behaviors that have been causing all this will occur. Thank you so much for your responses. We're going to move on to a second question. Okay, the second question is: How will you, as the BOE, work with parents to address? concerns about safety from assaults at school and school-sponsored events? We are, we are always focused on safety. So let me say, Nora, I want to thank you first for the question. And we are always counting on our parents to be the eyes and ears on the ground for us. So when people contact us, we take that very seriously. And we actually keep a record of what's going on in the schools. As you know, we have advisory boards and we have parents on those boards, community members. Um, as you know, Byron and Diego are, are often on many of our communities. I believe you both were on the reimagining police uh, force that the county had, that the county executive had. We also had parent representatives on that and parent and community representatives on the mental health work group that uh, council member Rice and Jawando had. So parents are, are our eyes and ears in the community and we appreciate their support. We don't always, I know people think we don't because we can't always do exactly what they want because we have to balance a number of uh, factors in the community, but we do listen. Any of my fellow board members want to jump in, please do. Yeah, hi, this is Scott Joftis. Um, Thank you for that, Brenda. I I would add that um, I think this is a really good example of what Dr. McKnight has been talking about as far as needing to differentiate more. This uh, school system has traditionally um, approached many of its schools in very, very similar ways. And there's reasons for, there are good reasons for doing that. But I I really do believe that the safety and wellness uh, issue, we need to start thinking more about how do we differentiate? There are different schools, different communities, all have different needs. And I think it's really important that we uh, provide some flexibility uh, at the school and and cluster levels to think a little bit differently based on the needs of their uh, students, staff, and communities. Thank you for your responses. Uh, Any last comments on this important issue of safety and wellness? I would just add um, communication, communication, communication between the parents and the school and the students and the school personnel. If the parents know that something is amiss, if the students know that something is amiss, please inform the school because there's a whole group of people whose job it is to maintain safety and wellness in the school. And every piece of information that you have can help them do a better job to uh, intervene so that uh, things don't escalate and happen. Thank you. And let me also add that this is an evolving process. It is not stagnant. We are constantly evaluating the situation and making adjustments. As you know, the the, um, SROs had been removed from the school buildings by the county executive through his budget process. And as a result of some of the activities and, and events that have happened in our school this year, we had to regroup and rethink about how we provide safety to our students and staff. So now we are trying to implement what we call the the CEO 2.0 program, which brings them back into the school to deal with the wellness teams and the appropriate staff within the school to provide support. They'll be providing support as they always have at the games. They'll be around at lunchtime because we've heard from our community that there was a safety issue 
and we are trying to strike a balance because we also recognize that many of our black and brown children don't feel the comfort level of having SROs in the school. So this is, it's constantly evolving and we're going to see if this helps resolve some of the issue, but we will constantly be evaluating what's going on. So if you have concerns, please come before the board, raise them with us. We're always listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sabrina, to move on to the second topic. Thank you. Thank you. Before you do, Nor, can I just acknowledge that Dr. Daka is on? Judy, can you say hi? Wait, there she is. She's always on. So I was surprised. Well, sorry, but... couldn't get my other Zoom off my screen. Thank you. I'm sorry, Nora. Go ahead. Shebra is also on. Okay. Yeah, Shebra's on too. Shebra. Hi, hi Shebra. Hi, so sorry I was having difficulty. I'm on my phone, so I can see nobody, but I am so happy to be here. You know that I would not miss this, so I had to figure it out, and I'm on my personal device, um, cell phone, but good to see everybody. Thank you. I'm Great. glad that both of you were able to make it. Sabrina? Thank you. Based on the Maryland report card, pre-COVID, 40% of Black, 30% of Brown, and 15% of ESOL high school students were proficient in math. And we also know from MCPS data that our youngest learners lost tremendous ground in literacy as a result of the pandemic. What are you as a board looking at and asking questions about to ensure that resources are targeted to and are achieving actual results in closing skills gaps. Well, I've been talking a lot. Shebra, Judy, you want to take that? Um, yes, you're, you're absolutely right about the elementary uh, areas. They had the worst fate uh, during COVID, but that just shows you how important the elementary teachers are. Um, we're also concerned because during our meeting last week for the mitigation, uh, meaning the summer school, the after school, uh, those kinds of things. Some of the students that had the lowest scores were not being uh, involved in that. And we don't know why. And we're asking staff to find that out, particularly for the African-American students. The number of African-American students taking advantage of these um, programs has is lower than you would expect. I was trying to pull that out, um, the numbers out for that. But uh, maybe I can do that a little bit later. Thank you, Judy. Anybody else want to speak on this? Yeah, the, the system's main interventions um, for learning loss are summer school, academic interventions during school, and tutoring after school, as well as professional development for teachers so that they can effectively use the interventions for students. So the main questions that we're asking, as uh, Judy Daka mentioned, is how many students that need tutoring are accessing tutoring for starters before we get some time in to see uh, the results. But if you're, if, if you're eligible and you're not even accessing it, then that's uh, problem number one. So that's one of the biggest questions that the, the board has brought up. And then summer school is coming. And so we're going to target that for the kids that need it the most. It'll be the same question. Of those that need it, how many are participating? That's step one. We also did an evaluation of the summer school program last year, and so that we know that there are some adjustments that are needed this year in order to be sure we're, we're getting the results that we want. But evaluation and monitoring is our primary strategy through reports from the superintendent. And by the way, Byron, I didn't mention that Dr. Monifa McKnight is on with us tonight. Um, if she would just like to wave and say hi, Dr. McKnight. Uh, yes, you might want to add something to this too. Monifa. Hi. Yes, I didn't want to take time, but I did want to say good evening. Thank you all so much for hosting this forum. Um, this is very important. And Sabrina, thank you for raising that question. You know, one of the areas of focus that the Board of Education is focused on is strategic plan 
is teaching and learning every initiative that we have under that really focuses on how we get to a detailed level of looking at who the students are who are most impacted by COVID-19 and who was whose learning was impacted prior to COVID-19 and why. And what are the resources that we have to put in place to support that? One, one other piece I will mention is we have really been digging in, looking at research-based programs that work for students, particularly around areas of literacy. Um, I know in one of our previous board meetings, we talked about a lot, of, a lot about the program, the science of reading, and which we're looking forward to implementing in our schools because that's been one that's been proven success um, for students and, and particularly students of, of color in so many other different places. And we look at some of the cultural pieces of our curriculum and all the things that make the learning relevant for our students as well. And it's all those pieces that have to come together so that we're personalizing the learning experience for our students so that they can grow and progress in the way that they do. So I just wanted to add that part in, but I think I also saw Dr. Joftis want to get into the conversation. So I won't take much time and let him as a board member, John. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say, I, um, the opportunity gaps for black and brown students, I believe to be this country's biggest shame. And I think the problem has always been one of um, uh, systemic racism um, and structural racism that prevent uh, students of color, especially from accessing the highest quality teachers. Um, and it's also a factor of um, um, I think Brenda was saying it, Ms. Wolf was saying, the need to be really systematic in how we implement programs. As Dr. McKnight just said, we know what works now. The science of reading has a, a long track record of um, being effective for all, to all readers. The key to, is to implement it effectively with the highest quality teachers in our schools. Um, and we need to focus intensely on, on doing that. And we're also expanding community schools. I wanted to throw that in there. And it's an opportunity under the blueprint if we, if and when we do receive that money to expand even further. So that's, that's an opportunity. Uh, another thing that seems to be helping some of our black and brown students is the virtual academy. For whatever reason, there is some, some students who seem to perform better by having the option of, of being in the academy. And I think it's the, the lack of stress of being in a school building because there are a lot of things that go on in a school as any of us know. And for some of our children, they just, they just never reach a comfort level there. Um, I just wanted to say, I did find um, information about student participation and all the programs you're talking about, virtual academy included and during the day and after school. Uh, for Black and African American, it's 28.8%. For Hispanic and Latino, it is 45.8%. And their scores are very close. So you can see that for some reason, the participation of Black and African American students needs to be monitored. And I do agree with Scott about the reading. Uh, we are hoping that we can find out which programs work the best in um, Montgomery County Public Schools because uh, as Brenda has said, and so did Jeanette before she left, after third grade, if they can't read, everything else is uh, really going haywire. And we've also, for those who are entering the school system, we're trying to bring them in better prepared. So we have taken some of the funding that we have gotten and expanded pre-K and under the blueprint, you know, there will be a big expansion over several years of the pre-K program. And that's an absolute must to ensure that our kids come to school ready to learn. So we also have summer program for rising kindergarten students which a lot of people don't may not realize, but there is an opportunity there if you're not yet in the school to start in the summer and get that head start. Does anybody else want to add to this? Yeah, I would yeah. just add, um, I That's have a real special interest in how we're serving our newcomer students and I'm very interested in um, Dr. McKnight's um, uh, it expressed interest to really 
do an intentional look at uh, national best practices on how to serve those students better, looking at high-performing districts like Oakland Unified, and also um, looking at some of our, our um, programs that are existing to serve that population of students, like our METS programs, um, looking at ways to do that work more efficiently, and our CREA program and trying to streamline the, the ability of students who would benefit most from a program like that um, to uh, access that, that combination of academics and career training. So um, I'm really interested in our in this us as a system really digging down into best practices because we're going to be a, a top ten recipient of newcomers for a long time, and I think that is uh, to our benefit. Rebecca, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I did. I just to um, Dr. Dreyfus's, um point earlier a little bit. You know, um, we are also been we've also been having conversations at the board table and with the superintendent and her staff in terms of really looking at the formulas that we're using in terms of how we're allocating resources to different schools and different populations and making sure um, that we are doing everything that we can to help provide schools and students with the highest needs. Um, the most supports. And I didn't know if um, Dr. McKnight or anybody wants to speak to that, but it's just one more thing that the board is, has been paying attention to. Okay, Cindy, I saw your sign go up. So I think we're ready for the next question. And I will ask um, Diego to please ask the questions about school culture and climate. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Sabrina, and thank you for the board members for being here and also Dr. McKnight. I just want to acknowledge that there's almost 300, okay, sure. 300 parents here with us. And I specifically, while I'm, 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 I'm listening to the answers, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Jemina Cabongo as in the car with her children uh, and they're very well behaved, I can see. And also, I, I just lost the, the uh, screen for uh, Romelia Pineda that is working at a restaurant uh, and she has her phone there while listening to the conversation. So, and there's countless other parents who are there with their children making an effort to be here tonight. So I really want to acknowledge them. And the question that I have to, <clears throat> that I want to ask is, we would like to see an equal amount of effort from MCPS to meet the needs and include the parents into key decision-making processes and participation. MCPS offers, offers lots of services uh, that our parents are dying, our children are dying to access. But for <clears throat> cultural barriers, for, and for other reasons, they just cannot access them. It also offers services that did not have our families in mind at the time of being designed. All this to the tremendous detriment to the children's future. So, MCPS has operated like this for, for decades and decades, and we need the board to and Dr. McKnight to really change the, the paradigm as to how it engages, how it, it uses an equity lens to, to, to operate in a way that it really brings black and brown into MCPS as collaborators. As I told you at the last board meeting, you know, if, if the tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, uh, does it really make a sound? No. If MCPS offers all these services, but the ones who need it the most are not able to access them, then does it make a difference? And what happens with all the money and hard work? So in light of that, <clears throat> the question is two questions. One is how is it that you as Board of Education members plan to integrate the results of the anti-racist audit you know, into the daily operations of MCPS? And how will you engage with the community, black and brown in particular, to collaborate on implementing specific actions that move MCPS towards being a more culturally responsive, more equitable, and more anti-racist system uh, to the benefit of particularly black, brown, and low-income families? So I'm gonna copy Nora and I'm gonna ask for one minute responses because there's another question that's very important. Thank you. You know, Diego, I have to say, I completely agree with you. 
in terms of outreach to black and brown communities. But we have a slight dilemma in that we go out, we go into the neighborhood and we still oftentimes don't reach them because they don't come out. So I would be very, very interested in other solutions because as you know, we are out in the neighborhood all the time from, I would say March until November. Almost every weekend you could find us somewhere standing up with a tent trying to reach out to parents to explain the services that are available. Now, you know that we have also added parent community coordinators, we've added community navigators, we've gone and knocked door to door, and we are now doing texting to parents. So any suggestions you have, I would appreciate it because uh, it's one of the sore spots I know particularly for me and Carla, we talk about it quite a bit. Do you want to jump in there, Carla, on that? So Brenda, before Carla speaks, I, I want to respond that throwing money to the problem has never worked and it's not working. So how come, that's why I illustrated uh, Mrs. Cabongo and, and Mrs. Pineda that are here tonight. So if we could do it, MCPS could too. But, but we have to find a better way. Uh, again, it's not, it's not thinking after the fact what we can do is thinking before things because other people do it very well all the time. So MCPS could too. And that's why we're asking for a paradigm shift here. Sorry for, this is your time, not mine, but yes. Well, I, I absolutely want to, in fact, I want you to tell me who's doing it better so we can go talk to them because we have made shifts and we've listened to our community. Like I said, we've gone in. Throw, we're going out knocking on doors. That's not really throwing money at the problem because we're using our own staff. They're not getting a lot for that. We have community navigators. So if you know of, of a system that we should have a conversation with, we greatly appreciate that. At well, least. We can start with the Black and Brown Coalition. Okay. I'm sorry. Carla. Go ahead, Diego. I didn't understand you. No, I said, Carla, you can go. I said you can start with the Black and Brown Coalition, which we're doing it today. We've been working with you all now for, what, three or four years. Great partnership. But go ahead, Carla. I, Carla, go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, this is a really hard question because you're right, Diego. It's about changing hearts and minds and paradigms. Um we have been talking about language access for as long as I have been MCPS, 14 years. Um, and then there's a little effort here and a little effort there. But um, um, yeah, I, I hope that one of the outcomes of the anti-racist audit will be a commitment to really work with the community to whenever anything is being designed and planned for that we have every type of parent in mind from the working parent to the single parent to the parent that doesn't speak English um, to the parent that has a lot of support. So when we design programs and engagement, we are not assuming that uh, we know what's happening at home. Um, I don't know what the anti-racist audit will tell us, but we do know some things that we've known for 10 years or so about low expectations of our of our children, about uh, lack of language access. And so all, there's things that we can start to work on today. Um, the Black and Brown Coalition had recommended that we hire education promoters following the health promoter model as a place to start uh, better engaging with our community. So um, all that to say is that I agree, um, but we, I do not see us right now having a way to change the paradigm. So we're, we're really going to have to coalesce and think of, a, uh, come together to come up with a, a way to um, make sure that everyone is thinking in terms of how do we engage, mutually engage our families, um, all of our families. Yeah, can I jump in here too as well? Um, yes, go ahead. Very, one minute, so we ask one more question. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'll be really quick. I just wanted to say, you know, um, Diego, I, I very, very much appreciate your comments. Um, I agree with you. It, it's it's about a change of culture in our system and the way of doing business. And unfortunately, with a system of the size and everything, sometimes um, it seems very slow in moving. We've been having conversations about how to engage different communities for years in years in my time on the board, um, we talk about it in our uh, community outreach and communications committees. Um, but things like, to your point about acknowledging how other, how some people are, have made it possible for them to be able to participate tonight and be here tonight. Um, you know, we've talked to people in um, in lower income housing about how is best to reach their residents. And they have indicated to us, text messaging is so much better than emailing because they don't, you know, they're not sitting at a computer most of the time. And, and this is something that they can kind of jump in and out of. Um, we're, I feel like we're making some progress, but I do think it would be incredibly beneficial if the Black and Brown Coalition, Identity and groups like that would help us put together a survey of how would parents like best to be able to communicate with our system, um, you know, and, and what works best for them so that we can get that feedback and try and incorporate it into the work that we do. Thank you, Rebecca. So I'll ask one more question. Mm -hmm. I know Dr. McKnight has a hand up and maybe you can answer the question. <laughs> so the Black and Brown Coalition has made a commitment to work with the anti-racist uh -huh. audit and with Dr. Uh -huh. McKnight to come up with specific recommendations. The question is uh, <clears throat> the how will the board use its power and also Dr. McKnight to oversee the implementation of these recommendations? And second, equally as important, will there be funding in this budget and next year's and, year and future year's budgets to ensure that these recommendations are implemented? Because we cannot think about band-aids. We need to look at, 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 at the system as a whole, take a deep look and change the way we work. Sorry, Dr. McKnight. Well, that's a, that's a great, meaty question, Diego. Um, and everybody here, we've got 40 minutes for you guys to talk to the board directly. Could we possibly put that in the end in the closing when the board does its wrap up and then we'd be able to stay on schedule and get to the uh, breakout session? What do you think of that? Well, I, I just been overruled. Dr. McKnight, if you have half a minute so we can go with the agenda and leave it to the parents, that would be great. Thank you, Sabrina. Half a minute. What do we do differently? One, we're transparent with the community about what is in that anti-racist audit, whether it's positive, negative, and deal with whatever it says about where we are as a system right now. Secondly, we don't do it in isolation as a system to come up with the solutions. We engage the community in developing partnerships to say what will we all do together as a community to change in the areas that are impacting areas of deficit within our community. I would expect that what we learn from this will be a priority in terms of what we resource currently and resource in future budgets, budgets to, to ultimately become an anti-racist system. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll pass it to Byron. Well, thank you. And <clears throat> I will uh, give you, a, hopefully, uh, to catch up some time so we can get to the breakouts. Equity is a core value of the Board of Education and a foundation of NCPS's strategic plan. The district furthermore states equity demands an elimination of gaps that MCPS distribute resources as necessary to provide extra supports and interventions so all students can. And MCPS will identify and eliminate institutional barriers to student success. Those are words from MCPS's website and their plan. The board has just approved a 2023 operating budget request of more than $0.9 billion. The question, in what specific areas will this budget make MCPS a more equitable school district? And please, we have, uh, three, we have one minute responses available for that. Then I have a, a very short yes, no question that follows. 
So I'm just going to, this is Rebecca, I'm just going to jump in and say, I think this a little bit goes back to, well, for me, some of this goes back to us really looking at and evaluating the way that we are distributing uh, distributing our resources um, to areas of need, to address areas of need. Um, and I don't know if um, this would be a good chance for Dr. McKnight to speak to that at all in terms of how we differentiate Um what, how many positions we put in, in different types of schools um, and, and some of the work that we're doing there. Yes, thank you, Ms. Mardowski, um, for <laughs> letting me jump in here. So I think our strategic plan should be the one area that we remain focused on because this is what our community members, our board members, and our staff have said. These are the three core areas of focus that the system has to differentiate um, address significant need and measure, is it making a difference for our students or not? And you can look into each of these areas to say what to see exactly what the resources are that are in our budget that gets at just that. When we look at um, a focus on teaching and learning, um, starting at with a, a basis of what are all the things that we need in our schools to, to definitely fill in some of these gaps, mainly in literacy and mathematics, and definitely looking at the elementary level, and then differentiating those resources for what's needed even more in a high need school. That's us acknowledging what we say also in our core statement of, we want to make, sh make sure it's an equitable experience for students and that does not always mean equal so that everyone gets what they need. So you see that in the space of teaching and learning. In operational excellence, you think about all these spaces of um, the, the operational priorities of teaching and learning, like technology. Um, and when you think about how we provide and invest in resources to make technology more available and more meaningful and more relevant to our students, and making sure that those in some schools aren't getting better resources than others, you see the equities piece there as well. And then well-being um, and the, the well-being of our, our staff and students actually getting to know in every school and in every office and every space within Montgomery County Public Schools, what is that story of wellness? Because we do know that we need well adults to invest in our students being well and getting the things that they need um, as we need our teachers to be best at being the teachers that they are in the classroom, our principals to be at their best, to be the best leaders in central office, to be the best that they can to support everything that the schools need. And so I just say that to you because I can go through the strategic plan immediately and call out in each of these areas. That's why you see these levels of differentiation for different schools based on these priorities. Well, you've covered it. Uh, did you cover professional development? Because we have quite an investment in professional development. We want to build capacity of our leaders and our staff to serve in the schools with the most need. Um, but that requires a different kind of training, we believe, than what we've been providing. We are adding mental health and student and staff support in the schools. We're evaluating our innovative calendar schools to see are we really getting what we're trying to get from those programs. Um, we are, as I said before, expanding our community schools. I think in terms of bang for a buck, that's a really big one right there, if we can expand that. We're working on recruiting more diverse teachers and more diverse staff and leadership roles so that students can see people that look like them. Um, we have rebranded the Department of Certification and Staffing. They're going out to a lot of different areas that they didn't go out to before. We've expanded access to courses, our signature programs. We have a Grow Your Own program, which is an opportunity to diversify the staff very well. So those are just a few of the things we're doing. But the budget is, is really laid out pretty well. And I, I believe you were on the budget review team, weren't you? Um, so you're, you're pretty familiar with the things that we are doing. And we do have a nice nifty little chart we could share with everybody. I don't know the link to it, but I think it would help people to understand and see where the money is going by year, where it has gone by year. Anybody else want to jump in? Cindy's holding up her card, but we have a few minutes. Go on, Judy. Oh, I, I, I agree with everything that Brenda said. She started out with professional development, and that's one of the areas that I think we could improve in. Um, not so much what we offer, 
But I think evaluating what goes on in the classroom is so important because kids will tell us, I'm not called on. I don't get enough time to answer. My expectations are, are not being met in the classroom. So we need to work on that as well. We have to start at a small place. And I've been saying for years, we need to talk to the students who are not doing well to find out what it is that we can do better. Anybody else want to jump in? I can't. Well, I mean, Go ahead, Carl. I mean, there, there's so many ways to define equity in a school system, in a budget. Um, in terms of resources, uh, Byron, you know that uh, our, no, our biggest expense is our staff. And so the, the, and you know this already, of course, that one of the biggest ways that we differentiate for equity is class size. So if a school has higher need, then the class size is smaller. One other, so that the teacher can have more time and attention to the students that need him or her the most. And as Brenda has already mentioned, another big uh, staff intervention is the community school model where we provide additional staff and support so that students and families that need that additional staff and support um, can receive it. So those are just two examples of um, where staffing is being uh, attributed to help offset um, equity issues. But like I said, there, there's dozens of things. I just wanted to point those two out. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to, Can I just I'm say one more thing? Yep. I'm sorry. I'll be really fast. I just want to say, you know, this is something that we've, as a board, um, have just really started having um, extend extensive conversations about, and we're in the beginning stages of it, um, and something that's been, you know, important. But in all of these topics that we're talking about, I think ultimately, as far as um, the board goes, you know, um, for us to accountability is um, what matters to, to Diego's point earlier, you know, we can put as much money as we want in different areas. It won't, if we're not looking at how we're holding ourselves and our systems um, accountable a, for each and every child, um, then it's not going to, it won't make a difference. So, um, you know, I think that with all of these different topics, you know, as far as us being a board um, in a role of oversight, we um, are, are trying to really look at using the strategic plan um, to hold ourselves and the system um, accountable for, for how we're addressing all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is going to be just a, a, a quick response. Myron, on the Myron, I think it's 725. Do we want to go on and, and give... 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Okay. Given the valuable and unique insights gained from the ERS study, will the board consider investing in a follow-up analysis by ERS to progress in improving resource equity and ensuring that student experience is no longer predictable by race, ethnicity? This is uh, pretty much a yes, no. Thank you for that question, Byron. And um, it's something that I, I've thought about, but I think you have to realize we are not yet back in what I would call a regular state of mind in the way the school is operating. And this is just not the time to try to uh, add on or redo or look at it, evaluate a study because we need to be normalized, if you understand what I'm trying to say. We need to be in a regular school year where um, students are coming to school regularly. Their, their, their um, education hasn't been getting interrupted by quarantines or sickness. So I would say it's going to be a couple of years before we would even be able to think about that. And then we also have to think about the budget. You know, our budget is now uh, really being taxed because we're trying to get out, uh, get into a recovery mode. I, I, I saw, I saw, something. she held up the thing and she said, my time is up, but I'm just saying, I'm not precluding it by any means, 
but I don't think that it's a question that we could even attempt to address right now until we become normalized and look at our budget situation. But it's certainly factors in the study that we could evaluate ourselves. Great. This is okay. Scott, can I add? Can I add one thing? This is Scott. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Scott. Okay, sorry about that. So I, I agree with, with what Brenda said. I, I do believe, though, that one of the key uh, recommendations that came out of the ERS study is to think about giving schools a little bit more uh, flexibility over their um, budgets. Um, and I do think that that is uh, something that Dr. McKnight has spoken about um, and that I'm very supportive of, giving principals and their leadership teams the opportunity to make more decisions around how they spend their resources will make it more likely that they can target um, the interventions and supports that their particular group of students uh, needs. And, um, I think that's something we can begin working on right away. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to shift gears. We're going to go to our breakouts. So I want to make sure people understand how they can um, move into the next space. The first thing we'd ask the facilitators that uh, already been designated to go and go down to the bottom of your screen and select your breakout room. The uh, Spanish interpreter, if they would also, they will be moving out of the language channel and into the um, Spanish breakout room. Second is board members. You have been, uh, hopefully you have in, in front of you, but if we will help you get to the different rooms. Uh, the main room here will be called English One, and that is, uh, has Dr. Daka and would have had Hannah Oluni, but Hannah, unfortunately, is doing our homework, uh, or fortunately, is doing our homework. Uh, we will also keep the Amharic and French interpreters in that room for that language channel. English Two, again, if your birthday is between May and August, please go to English 2. If your birthday is September to December, go to English 3. And if you are looking for Spanish, please go to the select the breakout room that's labeled Spanish. So we would ask that this round, uh, this is called round one of the breakouts. If people would proceed and select the breakout room. I'm sorry, Byron, but there is no room uh, that is says uh, Spanish. Nora, this is Janelle. I just made a room. Okay, thank you. Okay, a la gente que habla español, por favor vaya donde dice español. El, el cuarto so the rooms haven't been um, opened yet. I think someone on the administrative side needs to open that. There it goes. They're open. Okay. Ahora vayan donde dice español. Rooms are open. So again, please select the breakout room. Okay. Where where can can people see the breakout room? At the bottom of the. 